happen to our own. And there we go. Okay, thank you very much, Angela, and I'd like to thank everybody for uh, taking time out of their day to attend this presentation. I really appreciate it. And let's begin. So the analysis of there we go. So the finite element analysis of the historic Seventh Street self-anchor suspension bridge. And as Angela said, my name is Aaron Colorado. I'm an engineer with Michael Baker International. Um, I have a bachelor's in civil engineering and a master's in structural engineering from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. I have a PE license in Pennsylvania and Ohio, and I've been in industry for about five years, um, and I've had experience with design, inspection, and load rating of simple and complex structures. Uh, so briefly, what we're going to be going on is just a quick background of the bridge itself, um, the mechanics of a self-anchored suspension bridge, and how we decided that we were going to verify our um, MIDAS analysis, talk some in-depth about the model itself, and then our results and then the actual verification of um, our MIDAS model. So we'll start with the background, people who are familiar with Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, uh, in the Point District of the city, right next to PNC Park, are the 6th, 7th, and 9th Street bridges, known as the Three Sisters. Um, the Andy Warhol Bridge is a 7th Street bridge. It's there in the middle. This was the second bridge at this site. Um, Gustav Lindenthal actually had built a suspension bridge at the same location in 1884. But by 1889, it was deemed too low by the River and Harbor Act, and it had to be raised to allow uh, shipping to go across the Allegheny River. So what was ultimately decided was the uh, what was going to be built was the first self-anchored suspension bridge in the United States. It was constructed by the American Bridge Company of Ambridge, Pennsylvania, of which I am a proud alum, let's say, and the Foundation Company of New York. And it was the first of the Three Sisters bridges that were constructed from 1924 to 1928. So on the left, you can see there's the 1884 Lindenthal Bridge. And then on the right is, in 1925, the um, erection of the bridge that's there today. And then this is what the site looks like um, as of right now. And you can see it's a pretty congested site, so during construction it will be uh, location and access play somewhat of an issue. On the left there, above the bridge that's in the top, is um, Alcoa. In the very bottom left, you can see PNC Park. In the top right of that photo is the David L. Lawrence Convention Center. And then immediately to the right, just out of frame, is downtown Pittsburgh. So it's a very, very clustered site. This is what the structure layout is. It's 1,061 feet long in total from face to face of the above and back walls with a 884 foot main span. And this is a typical section looking through the deck. We have a 66 foot out to out, two 12 foot sidewalks, and a 37 and a half foot um, curb to curb width. And 37 foot six right now, there are four nine foot, four and a half inch lanes. And during the rehabilitation, we're going to cut that down to 37.5, and we're going to um, cut the roadway down to three lanes. So the structure elements that were modeled in MIDAS and that we would uh, provide load ratings for to our client, which would be Allegheny County, were the suspension tower, the chains, hangers, the stiffening girder, and the floor system, which is um, simple span, stringers, and floor beams. Currently, right now, there's a non-composite deck um, supported by buckle plates. So here you can see the, um, the tower suspension chain and the hangers, and you can also see uh, what the deck layout looks like today. Into the stiffening girder on the left, you can see there's a section through the girder. It's an interesting uh, design because it has three webs. And a wide bottom flange, you can see between the three webs are two hollow cells that are currently covered up with 
um, steel plate with hatches that can be open for uh, bridge inspection. And then on the right side of that uh, cross section is um, the side that supports the sidewalk and the other side supports the roadway. And here's in the underside of the bridge showing you the floor system, which has buckle plates sitting on stringers with uh, built up riveted floor beams. And you can see on the right there's some condition photos of what the deck and underside looks like now. Because the deck's non composite, um, the county has had issues with infiltration through the deck, as well as you can see on the bottom right, rusting of the buckle plates and then efflorescence and corrosion coming through the deck because of salt that's applied um, in the winter. Okay, so now we're going to go to uh, the, the mechanics of the self-anchor suspension bridge. And this is a traditional externally anchored suspension bridge where you have a live load applied to the deck is translated into tension in the cables, which are resisted by massive end anchorages. And in a traditional suspension bridge, the deck supports only the direct flexure of the live load itself. The only job of the deck, let's say, is to transfer the load to the hangers, which then in turn transfer the load to the cables. In a self-anchored suspension bridge, a live load applied to the deck is transferred to the hangers and results in tension in the cable. But because the cables are anchored to the suspension system, in our case, which is a stiffening girder, the tension in the cables is counteracted by compression in the deck. So now the deck and stiffening girder system that you design has to support not only direct flexure because of live load that's applied to it, it also has to um, support the direct axial compression that you get from the suspension system. So part of that is you eliminate the need for your end anchorages. So if you were to build one today and you had right-of-way issues, a self-anchored system could be an efficient choice. But counter to that is you have to size a girder or deck system for the effects of combined compression and flexure. Now, a lot of the research that we did into this system was figuring out, OK, we're going to model this in Midas, but how do we check ourselves? Well, so self-anchored suspension bridges can be analyzed elastically. And there was a treatise done by uh, Carl Gronquist, who was a member of ASCE and was writing a thesis for his uh, degree at the time. But a thesis called Simplified Theory of the Self-Anchored Suspension Bridge, Gronquist collected all the material that had been written to date in 1941 and compiled it into a method of analysis for self-anchored suspension bridges. And the typical deflection theory that's used for suspension bridges um, that was, is more common is also applicable to the situation. But as you'll see a few slides from now, you can take the deflection theory of a suspension bridge and you can reduce it by making certain assumptions to the elastic theory that's presented by Gronquist. So right here we have a diagram of half of the main span. So we have the center line of the tower on the right, and then where the wiggly marks are at the right would be the center line of the main span. And under a no live load condition, the cable has a sag of F. And if your girder is not flat, in our case it has a parabolic haunch, um, the haunch is represented by A. Now if we apply a load of P to the deck, and we make an assumption, one of the, the assumptions of the elastic theory is that the hangers themselves are inextensible. Then the deck and cable will deflect by a distance that I have called eta here. And that will result in a tension in the cable and an equal compression in the stiffening girder denoted by H. Now the deflection of the girder results in a moment at the tower shown by M1 and a resultant moment at the center line shown by M2. Now the interplay of the moment, the load P, and the axial compression and tension 
by assuming that eta is equal, the values of H, which is the tension and compression, will not change from one to the other. So the log load deflections um, caused by any sort of traffic, pedestrians, trucks, what have you, are offset by an increase in the chain tension and decrease in the girder compression. By the assumption of inaccessible hangers, the deflections have to be equal. If the deflections are equal, then the stress that's caused by the deflection is offset by the change in the girder moments that are caused by the increase in chain tension and the concurrent decrease in girder compression. Now, if you were to draw this as a free body diagram like I had before, and you sum moment about the tower, you can prove to yourself that the moment from the live load deflection will be offset by the chain force multiplied by the deflection. And then you can show that the axial force H is therefore unaffected by changes in geometry. So if the suspension bridge is unaffected by changes in geometry, then your analysis, which is called the elastic theory, you can, the analysis is linear. So a linear analysis means that superposition is valid and you can use influence lines to analyze any component of the structure. And this was going to form the basis of our independent check that we did by a combination of by hand and using Excel to check the resultant forces that we would get from Midas. So the finite element model that we created was actually a series of models that we decided to use for different purposes. Now this was a sort of a housekeeping decision by us to say um, instead of having all of our loads and geometry and all of that uh, put in one model, we were going to do everything step by step, one thing at a time. So if, for instance, we uh, were to mess up a certain load case, then we would be able to not affect anything else. So essentially what we had was a series of models where we established the base geometry of the structure, a model where we used the MIDAS suspension bridge wizard to determine the set of forces that are within the bridge under its own dead weight. And with that, we had to determine loading and boundary conditions. Then we had a model where we represented the loads that had occurred from all the changes of the bridge from the date of construction to today. So our initial force system model represents the bridge as it was built in 1925. And then we had a model that reflected all the various rehabilitations that had been done up to 2015 when we did the analysis. Then we created a separate uh, model for our moving and static live loads, where we had defined uh, PennDOT, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation standard loads, um, HL93, we did this LRFD, in addition to the PennDOT standard rating trucks. And our static live loads were wind loads that we applied as distributed loads on each member. Then we created another model for construction staging. And this was going to be a representative of our deck removal and pouring sequence. And there was actually a series of just construction staging models created to examine and chart the difference in forces that would result from different removal and pouring sequences, say removing the deck from one end to the other and pouring from one end to the other, or we would determine if we have to do all those operations symmetrically. And it would be a restriction that we'd have to place on our plan set um, for the contractor. And then we created a special model that was just for pedestrians. And the reasoning for that I'll get into in a moment. So here is, on the top, you can see this is the general elevation directly from our plan set. And then below is the elevation view of our final MIDAS model. So everything was done to be um, elevation correct. So the original plans define all of our elevations based on the bottom of the stiffening mirror. And we decided to model it exactly in the same way. So the Z, L, the Z um, dimension 
of every node in the model is exactly the same as it would be from the survey that was done when the bridge was constructed. And then on this, this is an end view of the model. And you can see on the right that the stepping up represents that we did it to the correct camber and grade of the original bridge. And then we made some simplifications of the portal framing system on the tower that would give us approximately the same lateral stiffness um, without having to model the entire um, portal frame there with, say, plate and shell elements. Now, to create the model, in lieu of doing it from scratch, part of the reasoning of using MIDAS for this analysis was that MIDAS has a suspension bridge creation wizard built directly into it. So we said, well, let's use this. So you can open a blank model and just define your materials and sections. And then you can use this wizard to define um, your entire bridge model three, in three dimensions or two, asymmetric. And you can define exactly where your hangers are, which makes it very powerful, especially for a bridge like this, where um, the end panels of the chain near the ends of the bridge and the floor beam spacing no longer line up. You can also model the deck width, unit weight, as well as the shape of the deck, where in our case, we input the entire main span of 442 feet and one inch on a symmetric vertical curve with uh, slopes of four and three eighths of a percent on and off. So this is the input control that we use for the suspension bridge wizard. You can see in the V units in the top left, that those are the actual elevations of each point as they would be on the bridge as it was originally built. The height was um, a simplification based on um, best way to put it was um, an interesting effect that we were having with putting the pin location at the bottom of the tower in the correct place was that might have been like that. So we put the point arbitrarily lower than the real point and then we modified it later on. We define two separate materials. And you can see on the top right, you basically define for the cable in the main span and side spans, your typical hanger and then your end hangers, and then a typical section for the deck and then the pylon, which is the tower leg. In our case, American Bridge devised a special high-strength steel for the I-bars, and everything else was a mild carbon steel typical of the time. And then you input a certain section, the section that you want MIDAS to use to, to calculate both the stiffness of the structure and the approximate weight when it creates the model. So you're not beholden only to those sections. After MIDAS gives you a base model, you can then modify those later on. So for our deck section, you can see left girder. Our deck is modeled only using one of the stiffening girders, but we would modify that later to include our floor system. We got around that by, you can see in the center there, the deck system, the width will define the, three dim the third dimension of the bridge, and then the unit weight was calculated, which it uses to calculate the initial forces in the suspension system. Now, of course, the suspension bridge wizard is geared towards the most common form of suspension bridge, which is a normal externally anchored suspension bridge. So a series of modifications had to be made to this bridge, to this bridge model, to get it to be representative of the bridge as it is today. And the four most important ones were to replace the default and boundary conditions that MIDAS creates, um, the insertion of our floor system, floor beam stringers, and then uh, the remaining dead loads on the system. We had to insert rigid links between the girder and chain ends. And that the rigid links are what make the model self-anchored. And then a modification to the actual suspension bridge analysis control module within MIDAS that is used to determine the initial element forces. So this is 
an isometric view of the Midas model at one of the ends. In, when Midas creates a, an externally anchored suspension bridge, the end elements, or I'm sorry, the end boundary conditions of the cable, which you can see coming in from the top, are normally fixed fixed. So they are completely fixed against translation and rotation. And then the supports of the deck are fixed against displacement in the out of plane or in the transverse and vertical directions and unrestrained everywhere else. So in order to make it self-anchored, what is done is deleting the end boundary conditions for the chains, modifying our um, end conditions for the floor beams to make sure that that longitudinal translation, which in this case is X, and that all of the rotations were free. And then the rigid link was inserted between the floor beam and the end of the chain. I'm sorry, the floor beam stiffening girder node. You can see where it says 111, 111. And then the end of the chain element. And that's what makes the whole system self-anchored. So you can see here on the right, that's an excerpt from the original plan set. And the model in MIDAS, the, uh, we used girder offsets for the, the stiffening girder, where the line that you see in MIDAS is defined at the bottom of the girder, which is the same as it was defined on the plan. So we used that, and then we checked ourselves to ensure that we were um, seeing the correct end moments that would result from the eccentricity of the point of, or the, the center line of the element and the center of gravity. And you can see also that the chain elements were defined at their center of gravity. And then for the four beams, we put in a flexural release at each end to represent the simple shear connection that you can see it's obviously there um, on the right side. It's just a pair of clip angles back to back. So the floor beams are modeled as longer than they are in reality. They connect directly to the center line of the stiffening girder, and they have a relief in their strong axis flexure direction. Um, the rest of the model, we have our two material definitions for two types of steel. Uh, 64 separate section properties covering the hangers, suspension chains, floor beam stringers, and the girders, which are meaning 736 nodes and over 1,000 elements, and then also including our rigid lengths and the beam end releases. These are three of the MIDAS windows that you'll see when you're doing a suspension bridge analysis. On the left is our nonlinear analysis control. Um, we specify this to be just a geometric, nonlinear uh, analysis. In the center is the suspension bridge analysis control. Where you can tell MIDAS um, to what tolerance it's going to place on the convergence of um, the, the um, item that you want it to um, converge on. In our case, it was forces. So our number of iterations was 5, conversion tolerance of 1 times 10 to the minus 5th. And we were looking for the initial force system for that. And then at the very bottom, load cases to be considered, you create a load group titled self-weight into which MIDAS will calculate the self-weight of every member that is represented in the model in addition to any um, additional dead loads or element loads that you specify that are in the self-weight group. And the end result on the right from the MIDAS tree menu, you can see that MIDAS will generate a series of tables which contain the initial forces for every element in the structure. And what I say when I mean initial forces, whoops, um, the other um, change that we had to make within the suspension bridge analysis control is that MIDAS, for an externally anchored suspension bridge, wants you to specify the location of the SAG node, 
the SAG node, where you see depicted on the right, is the location that MIDAS will hold while it updates the locations of all the other nodes as it performs the analysis seeking the forces in the system. Well, in the case of our self-anchored suspension bridge, that's not truly correct if we want to proceed with the assumption that the hangers are inextensible. So what is done is in the analysis control, they ask you to specify a group of SAG nodes. So for a typical case, that would be every node between the hanger and the suspension chain along the main span there. So in order to get around that, what we did was just create a dummy blank load group and specify that so that MIDAS would update the positions of every node as it needed to to determine our system of forces. Okay, now what I mean by initial element forces and positions is that there are essentially two numerical methods for determining the system forces that are in a suspension bridge just sitting there under its own dead weight. There is a deformed position and an undeformed position. The undeformed position is like the cambered position of a truss before it's set on its bearings. The truss under its own weight will then deflect downward into what you specify as the final geometry of the bridge. That final geometry is the deformed position, and what we would call the cambered position is undeformed. So there are two methods that you can use to seek out the initial element forces within the suspension bridge. Is you can either look for the undeformed position, knowing the final position that you want, and um, the system of load that you're placing on the bridge, and then you would simply turn gravity on or apply itself weight, and the bridge will deflect down into the final geometry. Now, the opposite, the other method is to just model the bridge in its deformed position and then seek force, e force equilibrium of that position. So in essence, deformations and deflections have already taken place. The bridge is in its final position, so you just need to find the system of forces within all the elements that would result in equilibrium. Now, each one of one and two there are completely equivalent geometric nonlinear methods of solving for the undeformed position, I'm sorry, the system of forces within a suspension bridge. The MIDAS suspension bridge analysis control uses method two, so that's how we proceeded. And MIDAS determines our initial element forces from the structured geometry, which is input both from the suspension bridge wizard, and then all of our modifications after that. And then also the system of load that we apply in addition to the structure's own self-weight. Now part of that are, was after MIDAS has determined the system of forces, if we run the model with just its own self-weight, we should see no deflections under the self-weight load case. And the way MIDAS handles that, when you include other element forces within it, or I'm sorry, other load cases, examining additional dead loads, live loads, what have you, it includes these initial element forces as a geometric stiffness, which it adds to the stiffnesses of each individual element. So we have our geometry already defined. So the additional prescribed loads that we have are the full design dead loads, which we're lucky to have the full set of shop drawings for the bridge, as well as its original calculations, as well as calculations of changes in dead load from 1925 to 2015. And we included one half of the design live load that was originally specified for the bridge, which was 66 pounds per square foot, plus one half of a design trolley which in the case of the design of the main span, the original designers used just a distributed line load on the structure. So in the um, design drawings of the bridge, it's noted that the bridge was 
cambered for the dead load plus one half of the design live load. So these were included in the in the um, initial element forces to represent the full cambered position of the bridge. So the end result is we receive a table of 1,091 rows for every beam, truss, all the different elements of the bridge, which shows our actual force, shears, torsions, and moments for every single element under its own self-weight. So building on this, we continued on and then defined our additional models. So on the left, you can see these are the system of dead loads that we use to get the correct um, both today's dead load and our proposed dead load um, after the rehabilitation. So we have the bridge itself late, current day dead load adjusts. So basically there have been some subtractions and additions of dead load that we included as line loads. Um, the removal of the 2015 deck, the current deck, and then our proposed DC and DW loads for the bridge. In the center is our was our moving load our live load analysis model where we define a moving load analysis. And what's particularly nice about Midas is that all of the PennDOT um, specific trucks are already defined, so they're merely a standard definition that you pull directly from a library. We had eight traffic lanes defined on the bridge, um, three design lanes, three of 12 feet, shifted toward the left side of the bridge and the right, and then one lane for each sidewalk. And then the vehicles are defined for HL93, H20, HS20, et cetera, as well as we included pedestrian as a, a, um, as a lane load to examine the effects of combined traffic and pedestrians on the structure. And on the right, you can see our static live loads that we have defined are the basic ashto wind loads at various angles of attack and temperature rise and fall. Now, building on removal of the existing deck and placement of the new deck, one of our models, our additional models, is the construction sequence. So here, you can see this is how we determine to um, do the removal and then following the placement of the bridge or the bridge deck was we decided to use just simple line loads applied to the stringers so that the for flow of forces would be similar to what the original designers conceived, so from the deck to the stringers to the floor beams, and then that way the deck loads would be applied essentially as point loads at each panel point of the bridge. Now through the separate models that we created, we determined that there would be no overstress if the contractor decided to remove the deck from one end to the other. So that's represented here. At the top is removing the first panel from the end floor beam to the first one, and then progressing until you reach the opposite side of the bridge. Now our separate load cases within that model are the placement of the new deck panels. And these were applied in exactly the same way, except that the contractor would have to skip that first bay between the two floor beams so that he would still have room to perform final structural steel repairs and placement of the new um, expansion dams and some small steel repairs in that area. So they would have to leapfrog that first panel. And we determined that placing the deck from one end to the other was not feasible. There would be several members that were going to be overstressed. So the deck placement now has to progress from the flanking spans towards the center. And then finally, the last two small pores at the end bays can be poured at the very end. And now the special model that we created for all of this is a special pedestrian only load case. Um, because the bridge, and in essence all three bridges in the end, because all three are going to be re rehabilitated, 
because of their proximity to PNC Park, Heinz Field, downtown, the Convention Center, um, the Carnegie Science Center, there are several, several, several places, um, popular places to go that are very close to these bridges. And occasionally these bridges are closed to have concerts on them, they shoot fireworks off of them. Um, Picklesburg, which was a pickle festival, was held on the Rachel Carson, which is the 9th Street Bridge very recently. And the 6th Street Bridge, if anyone's familiar with going to Pirates games, the 6th Street Bridge is closed so that people can park downtown and walk to the game instead of parking on the North Shore closer to the stadium. So we determined that a case where the bridge is closed and open only to pedestrians could be a controlling load case because of just the magnitude of loading that can be seen. You imagine a crowd of people leaving a, a baseball game or sitting there watching fireworks could be fairly large. So what we decided to do was take pedestrian loads in pounds per square foot and input those as lane loads, just as we did before and as you would do for a truck, to find the worst case pattern loading that would give us um, the maximum forces in various elements. So for this case, we had a traffic line lane defined for the left and right sidewalks, and then we split the roadway in half and modeled the left and right halves of the sidewalk. And then we had vehicles, quote unquote, defined with um, just lane loads of pedestrians, which X pounds per square foot times the width of the lane applied to the line load. And of course, we delved even further into that by examining three separate pedestrian design loadings by looking at 66 pounds per square foot which would be in line with the original calculations, 75 pounds per square foot, which is consistent with the most recent edition of AASHTO, the LRFD bridge design specs, and then 90 PSF, which is specified in the AASHTO pedestrian bridge design spec. We felt that all three of these are warranted based on a comparison to original design, current practice for a vehicular bridge and if we were to treat the bridge as a pedestrian bridge. And then we also, in the same vein as the AASHTO load combinations in Chapter 3, created a series of strength and load cases so that we could examine maximum factored forces with and without future wearing surface as well as serviceability requirements like deflections. Now the 65, 66, 75, and 90 PSF kind of come into play because if you read the AASHTO pedestrian bridge specifications, you'll see that they define, talk about a maximum credible pedestrian load. So as opposed to like a notional load where we could say, oh, this, we're going to use 300 pounds per square foot for our loading, there is to some degree a physical limitation on how many people you can fit in a given space. Now these images are taken directly from the Ashto pedestrian bridge spec and you can see 50 PSS might be representative of people leaving a baseball game, just walking across the bridge, but they're relatively tightly clustered. 100 pounds per square foot gets pretty close and 150 pounds per square foot is just plain uncomfortable. But if you take that 90 pounds per square foot that's specified in the AASHTO pedestrian bridge spec and apply the 1.75 load factor for strength one, you'll get 158 PSF, which as they explain in the bridge spec, is pretty close to what we would call the maximum credible pedestrian load. And if you look at that image, you really can't fit any more people within that space. So 150 PSF is going to be on the upper bound of just the physical capability of fitting people in there. The end result of all this was to include a sheet within our plan for the use of the county to help determine uh, for planned events and say closures of the bridge to vehicles and, and open to pedestrians only. We give them a, a series of diagrams and tables for different um, pedestrian loads, so there's a table for 66, 75, and 90 PSF, and then there's a loading diagram for 
controlling elements um, in different places on the brick. So we chose the worst, found the minimum factored resistance of a suspension chain element, a hanger element, and a stiffening girder element. And as you can see on the left, we're showing the maximum forces for the hanger at panel point number four. So that there is the pattern of loading of pedestrians, excuse me, that would produce the maximum factored force in that hanger. And that was the end goal was to be able to provide the county and the clients this information and say, you can use this in helping determine if a proposed event would cause serious overstress to a bridge or if everything would be just fine. So finally, we come to the results, our results of our model and our verification of the model. So for our verification, as I talked uh, several minutes ago about the deflection theory or the elastic theory, and these are a series of publications that we use to determine the approach that we were going to use for verifying our model. On the bottom left, simplified theory of the self-anchored suspension bridge by Carl Gwonquist. That was our go-to um, resource. And then on the right, a practical treatise on suspension bridges by David Bernard Steinman, who was considered the god of suspension bridge design and erection. Gronquist pulled many of the same equations from directly from Steinman's work and was able to make the assumptions that created the elastic theory. So the primary difference between the two is, as we discussed before, the elastic theory. The distortions of the bridge do not change the state of stress, which we call linearity. And the elastic theory was given this complete treatise by Steinman as well. Deflection theory, the distortions change the state of stress, which gives us nonlinearity, which means that our superposition and influence, line, influence lines excuse me, are not valid for that analysis. So the series of assumptions that Gronquist made in the elastic theory are that the curve of both the chain and the girder are parabolic. In the case of the girder, if there is a curvature, it would be parabolic. <coughs> Excuse me. That the dead load of the structure is uniformly distributed along its length. That all hangers are vertical and they remain vertical. That the hangers are inextensible. And in any given span, whether the flanking span or the main span, the girder moment of inertia is constant. Now, if you use all these assumptions, you can put these assumptions into Steinman's treatise on standard or regular suspension bridges, and you would result with Gronquist's elastic theory. And by examining the way the forces behave, you'll observe that a self-anchored suspension bridge is much more similar to an upside-down tied arch or even a cable stay than it is similar to a traditional suspension bridge. So in our use of the elastic theory for this bridge, we looked at the structure span versus its flexural stiffness. The bridge is very, very stiff for its span to which we would, which will affect the magnitude of the forces that you get for, um, for any given load scenario. The structure span versus its vertical grade and camber. If you drive on or drive or walk on these bridges, you'll see the camber is quite great for their span as well. And we also examine the original design methodology, which used something very similar to Gronquist's work. And was actually some simplifications made from Steinman's work. Um, the first edition of which had been published right about the time that these bridges were being designed. <coughs> Excuse me. So for our final results and verification, or the way we look at it, expectations versus reality, 
to look at our MIDAS model and compare it to our elastic theory, our expectations were that the elastic theory was going to give us larger dead load forces. And that's by virtue of that the MIDAS model does use non geometric nonlinearity in calculating the element forces. The Stiffninger end moments will be of the same sign. You would expect that as a check because of the way the pin, the, um, the difference in elevation between the pin of the connect the chain to the stiffening girder and the center of gravity of the girder do not occur together. So any load on the stiffening girder, I'm sorry, on the suspension chain should induce a negative moment at the end of the stiffening girder. And then we said that the stiffening girder dead load moments would be of the same order of magnitude. And those were the expectations that we were going to use to say, we feel comfortable with both the for forces that the MIDAS model has given us and then the proposed forces that we would be calculating um, for our live loads, construction sequences, et cetera. So what was reality? This here is a chart of the suspension chain axial tension. So each element within the, the suspension chain these are the forces due to the full design live load and one half of the, I'm sorry, full design dead load and one half of the original design live load. So you can see the black line are the axial forces predicted by the elastic theory. The blue line are those taken directly from the original plan sheets. And the red line is, are the axial forces we obtained from the MIDAS suspension bridge analysis control. They are, they follow the same relative slopes <coughs> and the maximum axial forces which occur in the element directly adjacent to the tower, we observe the difference of 396 kips, which represents the difference of only 8.5% out of the total um, axial force in that element. So we were very comfortable with this, that these two separate, completely separate methods of analysis would give us an axial force this close. We felt very good about these results. Now this is a chart of our stiffening girder dead load strong axis moment. So bending about the strong axis, the strong, strong axis flexure of the stiffening girder. Again, this is still due to full design dead load plus one half the design live load. And you can see somehow my uh, center lines there moved, but at the very end of the bridge, or the far left end is the left end of the flanking span, in the center is the tower, and the right is the center line of the main span. Again, the blue line are the, plan, the moments taken directly from the plan sheet black line, the moments from the elastic theory, and the red line from MIDAS. Now you can see that the plan sheet moments don't really follow um, any other calculated moments that we have. And we determined that the reason for that is from the plan sheets, the original designers considered that the only moment that would be in the stiffening girder would be due to its axial force times the difference in distance between the center of gravity of the girder and the point of application of the axial force. So the designers considered that point of application to be the end pin all the way at the left end of the bridge. So those moments that you see in blue are merely the difference between that location on the girder and the girder center of gravity, which changes as you move from panel to panel, and the axial force. But what they didn't consider was the fact that the pull of the chain at the end of the girder also influences that moment. That was left out in the original calculations. So we're discounting that blue line, and we're only looking at the red and black. And you can see at the very end, the negative moment at the end of the stiffening girder, 2,600 foot kips versus 
2,750 foot caps. That's pretty close. And you can see that the, the sign of the moments, positive versus negative, follow each other very well. They change sign at approximately the same location. And we get approximately the exact same moment as you get towards panel point 19 and 20, which are at the center line of the bridge. Now, because they maintain the same sign, <coughs> excuse me, and the magnitudes are relatively similar, we felt confident that Midas was giving us the correct system of forces that we were seeing. And because the Midas suspension bridge forces we got, you can see, are larger, any difference would be on the conservative side. So we decided to go ahead and use the Midas suspension bridge analysis forces to do all of our load rating calculations and the preparation of our um, design for rehabilitation. And that is all that I have. Okay, um, Aaron, thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, everyone, I actually have a couple of questions in the seminar. Um, so we will first cover the couple of questions. Meanwhile, if you happen to have any questions, uh, feel free to take this time. Um, um, Angela, I'm sorry, you're very broken up. I can't hear. Um, I couldn't make out anything you were saying there. Okay, is it better now? Uh, much better. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, we have a couple of questions raised amongst the audience. Uh, right now, if you have not had a chance to raise any questions, uh, right now is the chance. Feel free to take it right now. And now let's just go over a few questions that's been raised already. Give me one second. Okay, um, the two uh, questions that's been raised during the seminar are um, presented on the screen right now. Aaron, um, do you mind going over these questions? No, not at all. Okay, so our first question, in the initial force system model, was the original construction sequencing reflected? Was information and details on the sequence used on the original bridge available? Um, the answer to both questions is partially. Um, we had a portion of the original erection calculations that were done by American Bridge, um, but they weren't particularly clear in the forces that they determined would be in each element. Um, the bridges were constructed as cantilevered trusses. Um, they were built from one, from each bank of the river toward the center and they inserted temporary diagonal members between the chain and the stiffening girder to basically create a truss. And then the bridges were jacked together um, from the roller. T one tower um, has a roller and the other is fixed. Um, they would jack the bridges apart and then jack them together to insert a shim at the center line of the bridge, which would close the bridge. Um, we don't have a great deal of information on exactly how that was determined, and some of it is unclear. So what we decided to do was just model the bridge from its um, finished geometry and then move on from there. And how did we analyze the wind effect in the bridge? Um, that was done with uh, static live loads. We just applied static um, element loads to the suspension chains, towers, and stiffening girders, and examine those with the um, just the standard Ashto LRFD load combinations. And we found that they did not control um, in just about every element force. Um, the controlling forces were typically either on the HL93 truck or, in some cases, the pedestrian load. Okay, next questions.
were the pins evaluated with the bridge and did they control anywhere? Yes, we did evaluate all the pins um, in the hangers and the suspension chain. They, do not con they did not control um, at any location. Um, the larger pins are 14 inches in diameter and then the hangers use um, five and a half inch diameter pins. In no location were they controlling. Was the construction sequence calculated as elastic or nonlinear? Um, we did the construction sequence elastically, um, treating the elements as, I'm sorry, treating the loads as just simple line loads. Um, we felt because of the bridge stiffness and relative insensitivity to displacements that um, using an elastic approach was appropriate. Okay, these are the last sets. Okay. How far was the vehicle load applied from the curb? In other words, do you keep a distance or is it applied as close as possible to the curb? Um, the closest distance would be two feet from the curb, uh, which is consistent with the AASHTO load distribution. Um, and we would shift it from left to right within the lane, um, which is an option within MIDAS, um, moving live load definition is you can move the truck anywhere within the 12-foot design lane, but we always maintain two feet from the curb. Was there any consideration or examination of dynamic effects of wind or live loads, either vehicle or pedestrian? Um, we did not. Um, there was no scope for, the bridge is not scoped to a dynamic analysis of wind, for example, for a wind tunnel. Um, and for wind and live loads, um, we did not look at that, and that was, the decision on that was based on the relative, again, the stiffness of the bridge compared to its span that any deflection that we observed from our static analysis was very minor, so we can, did not consider dynamic effects. Okay, can you... If there are additional questions, um, anyone can feel free to email me. My email is on the end of the slide, and I'll be more than happy to answer their questions. Thanks for offering that, Aaron. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Thank you. For the time being, we are going to wrap up over here. Um, as Aaron mentioned, I will be providing Aaron's contact information in the follow-up email. Um, feel free to reach out to him and serve the purpose of this webinar, um, our another purpose of doing this. Um, you know, making our engineering community um, bigger and more connected. Um, thank you so much for offering that, Aaron. And um, adding on to the live load question, I just wanted to share um, some information about our upcoming development item since that was related to um, the question and also Aaron's um, answer. Uh, currently, for the live load um, transverse evaluation, you could actually um, uh, Follow the vehicle within the lane. Uh, what we are currently working on for um, the development release in December is to be able to float the vehicle lane, um, you know, anywhere within the bridge width. So that's something, you know, if that's been something that you are looking forward to or trying to use within Midas, um, that's a good news for you. Um, and again, I want to really thank Aaron once again. Thank you so much for your great, great presentation. Um, and yep, thank you for your time and we'll keep in touch. And for thank the you. last one, no problem. Um, the next upcoming seminar is actually on, um, it's going to be by, by Ashley Haragia. She actually works at the state government entity. Um, the, the topic that she will be covering is a curved steel top girder bridge load braiding. It's actually the bridge in Connecticut, uh, number 05561. Um, if you happen to have any curved um, um, steel top girder structure, um, this is something that you could also learn about. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time today. Uh, we will close here today and hope to see you all next time. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you again. Thank you.